I know without a shadow of a doubt that what I've got to share this morning is from the Lord and it's meant for you. And those of us who didn't come to church this morning, well, they didn't come, but you did. And this is meant for you. Okay, I'm going to hold it together and I'm going to tell you what I feel that I should share with you. I'm going to start with a lovely story. They say that, you know, when you do a a speech or a sermon or something, you should start with a joke. Well, I couldn't find a joke that was appropriate, so I thought I'll share with you a lovely story. And this happened in my house years ago. I've got four kids. I'll pull myself together in a minute. I just got very emotional in all that lovely worship. It was phenomenal, wasn't it? Wasn't it amazing? Wasn't it amazing? We are privileged, we are so privileged to stand in the presence of God all the time. But sometimes the presence of the Lord is so real, so real. And it's going to be like that in eternity. Let me tell you my story. I've got four fantastic kids, two girls, two boys, all grown up adults now. When one of them was the two girls are first and then the two boys... In the school holidays years ago, um, they were all catching the white butterflies outside and catching them with two hands like this and taking them to their bedroom and letting them loose, the two boys' bedroom. And they're having fun. It was the whole day. And at the end of the day, they must have had 50 million butterflies in the bedroom. There were none out in the garden. They're the ones that eat your plants, so I didn't mind. I probably should have because all their little white bits on their wings were disappearing as they played with them. Every butterfly had a name and it was time for tea. And I said to the children, we're going to let those butterflies go now. They need to go home to their mummies and daddies and have tea and you need to come to the table and have yours. And They couldn't get rid of the butterflies. So we opened the window, took off the screen and let the butterflies go. And I called the kiddies up for tea and my son came crying. He said, Mummy, Faithful. The butterfly called Faithful. Every butterfly had a name. This one was Faithful. Faithful is not going home for his dinner. So I came to the bedroom and there was Faithful. His wings were clear. He had no white left on them. He'd been played with too much. And Faithful clearly was dead. (laughs) So he was about three. And he said, we'll have a funeral. So we got a matchbox. Hard to find a matchbox in our house because nobody uses matches much. But anyway, we got a matchbox. We put Faithful in them. No, it wasn't Faithful, sorry, it was Graceful. Graceful was the butterfly's name. So we put Graceful in the box and the children prepared to have a funeral. Well, they'd been to church so many times they knew how to run a service. I don't know about a funeral, but they knew how to run a service. So out they went in a procession down the passageway and my son was carrying Graceful in the box, the matchbox, and he was heading up the funeral. Halfway to the front door, and they were going to bury him under a big tree out the front of our house. Halfway to the front door, Garth, my son, who was carrying the box, decided he needed to go to the toilet. So off he went. He expected everything to stop, but it didn't. The children carried on. They dug the little hole. They buried Graceful. They said a prayer. They sung a song. They came in for tea. And he came out of the toilet. Where's Graceful, he said. The kid said he's buried. He's in a hole under the tree. Oh, he said, I was going to conduct the service or I was going to say a prayer or something like that. They said, never mind. We'll dig him up and we'll do it again. (laughs) So they did. They dug him up. They went back to the bedroom. They proceeded out with Graceful in the box. And they were going to bury him. The hole was fresh now because it had already been dug. And they were going to bury 
he said. Do you think I could have another look at Graceful just before we put him in the hole? And they said yes. So they opened the box. Graceful flew away. (laughs) Graceful up and flew away. Listen to this. This is the bit I want you to remember. My son said, oh, he wasn't dead. And my other children who were a little bit older said, yes, he was. Yes, he was. They said, no, he wasn't dead. When I went to the toilet, I sat there and I prayed with all my heart. Jesus, make him rise from the dead. Make him rise from the dead. And he did. And he did. You know, I was there and I remember that so clearly. Because I thought the... the, the um, what is it, the word of little children? The, the innocence, the, 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 the way they believe is wonderful. And we lose that. We lose that. So that's my story. It's partly a little bit to do with my message, but it's also to do with better than a joke. The word today that I want to bring to you that I know is from the Lord is 2 Timothy 2.2. You can remember that, and I want you to. 2 Timothy 2.2. Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher in a church, and Paul wrote to him two lovely letters. He wrote quite a few to everybody else. Two-thirds of the New Testament is written by Paul, and actually 90% of the two-thirds was written from a prison cell. We think we've got problems. 2 Timothy 2.2. This is what it says. Don't look it up. Listen. For you must teach others these things. You and many others have heard me speak about. Teach these great truths to trustworthy men who will in turn pass them on to others. That's the living version from the Living Bible. That's the New King James up there. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You must remember, ladies, that when the Bible talks about men, it's just a gender situation. It means ladies as well. The the Amplified Bible says this. I have it here. And the instructions which you have heard from me alone with many witnesses transmit and entrust as a deposit to reliable and faithful men who will be competent and qualified to teach others also. So when we receive the word, when we receive salvation, it's up to us to make an effort to find someone else to do the same. Now, you know, in those multi-level things where they say, if you um, buy into this particular program, and some of them are good, I'm not knocking them, but some of them say, if you buy into this and you get three more people and they get three more people and you get three more people, at the end of a period of time, you will have, they have mega, huge numbers. At the end of, you know, four or five people telling people, there's huge numbers. Let me tell you this. If you tell three people about the gospel and invite them to have Jesus in their lives and they decide that that's what they'd like and they do the same, you've got three folks that you've seen saved. If they do the same in one year, let's say they do it, we do this every one year, not once every week, once a year. The next year you've got nine people because three threes are nine. The next year you've got 27 because nine threes are 27. And so it goes. It quickly becomes thousands. And that's, I'm allowing for us to talk to somebody about Jesus and teach them to do the same once a year. But if we were to do that once every week or once every six months, we would have a revolution. We would have a revival. We would have something significant. You wouldn't be able to get a seat in this place today. Okay. There's a scripture in Ezekiel that I also want to bring out. And this is Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And if the other scripture was the good news, this is the bad news for Christians. But I need you to pay attention. I don't want you to forget this. Remember, I know more than ever in my life that this message, it's a hard one for me to bring. And this scripture is really hard. This is Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19. If you refuse to warn the wicked when I want you to tell them, you are under the penalty of death. Therefore, repent and save your life. 
They will die in their sins, but I will punish you. I will demand your blood for theirs. That's a scripture that I knew about in the Bible, but I don't go to very often. It's pretty harsh. Here's verse 19. But if you warn them and they keep on, their, and keep on sinning and refuse to repent, they will die in their sins, but you are blameless. You have done all that you could. Here's the amplified version. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not give him warning or speak or warn the wicked to turn from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he, does, and he, and he turn not from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity but you have delivered yourself. The word wicked, you know, language changes. We, wicked in the Bible means people who haven't committed their lives to Jesus. Wicked to people, my generation, means people who are evil. Most of you know here I've taught in prisons, maximum security prisons, and I would honestly say some of those people were wicked. They did some very, 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 very evil things. I taught the worst of the worst. I didn't teach people who were in there for not paying their parking fines. I, pay, I taught the worst of the worst. So I know what wicked is from meeting people and they look perfectly lovely some of the time because they're not given the opportunity to be wicked in that, in that setting in a prison. But listen to this, language changes. Young people today call wicked, good things wicked. Oh, that's wicked. And it means something totally different. Totally different. It's cool. It's wicked. Oh, that's wicked. Let's have some of that. It's wicked. And, and language changes. And even dictionary writers recognise that. But wicked in the Bible is people who don't know Jesus, who haven't made their commitment. So when we talk about wicked, we of my generation and possibly yours think of very evil people. And things get desensitised over time. I remember reading in the paper about a school teacher. He, I didn't know him, but I read about it in the paper. And then there was an article written in the paper, and then they interviewed him on television because it was quite powerful. And he lived up in Greenmount, and he used to travel home from work every day. And he saw an accident on a very bad strip of Greenmount Hill, and there was often accidents there. So he, he said that he thought as he passed by, oh, it's okay, the ambulance is already there, I don't need to stop, but I must remember to watch the news tonight to see what actually happened. And when he got home, he wept because he said, I'd become so de desensitised that all I was interested in was what happened. And we can become desensitised. They got that guy and they put him on the television and he was so honest he was lovely. I don't know whether he's a Christian, but he said how he'd become desensitised. And as a teacher, as a lover of people, as a lover of children, he couldn't believe that he could become desensitised. I can't believe how I can become desensitised. It's a, almost a, a thing of the age where we can easily become desensitised. People are going to hell and we could have told them. We could have told them. You know what? One day we will all be in eternity. And eternity is going to be wonderful for those of us who love Jesus. Let me read you this. Just imagine we're all in heaven now. I wrote this, but I wanted you to, to um, hear it as it actually I pinched this from a sermon that um, Lex had. So I, didn't, I just wrote it off his sermon. Just imagine we're all in heaven now. We've just stepped into eternity our position there is signed, sealed, and delivered. There is no going back, no, chan no chance to fix or alter things. There's no repentance allowed. It's final. Please join me now in imagining what the future holds for you. Imagine that we are already there and we're now looking back on the times of our life on earth. Can you see the gravity, the severity, the importance and the great potential of these things and make the necessary changes and adjustments now before it's too late? The spirit of the world which contains the spirit of error, 
ridicules the things of God, neutralizes sin, mocks righteousness. We've all, we've all had it happen to us in the workplace, in the lunchroom, in the shopping centre, on the bus stop. We've been ridiculed if we opened our mouths. It denies the spirit of the world, denies the judgment to come. It exalts and glorifies man now. It focuses on the temporary and it focuses on the material world. Me now, me now. That's the world's slogan. It's all about me. God's spirit is at work in us, which is the spirit of truth. It convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. That's, I, can, I can give you chapter and verse for everything I'm saying, but I just want to cut to the chase and have you listen. It exalts the Spirit of God, which is a work, at work in us, exalts and glorifies God. It focuses on the eternal. More and more, what the Bible defines as sin is being legitimized by the world, but it won't and it can't, can't last forever. The world legitimizes sin. We know that. It makes it sound like it's good. Sometimes you say to people, you get, you get the courage and you talk to them about heaven and hell, and they say, oh, well, you know, if I go to hell, I'll be with all my mates. And we've all heard that. It's a joke. Today, there is no guilt in sin. It's been neutralized. There is no shame in sin anymore. So now the unsaved thinks that they have no need to repent. The sinner must be made to know and feel helpless and condemned on the, under the weight of sin. There was a very famous preacher who lived 250 years ago. He said this. His name is Charles Finney. He was a wonderful evangelist. He did a lot of good things. 250 years ago, he said, Many people, if permitted to speak on Judgment Day, would curse you for letting them end up in hell by your worldly lifestyle. That was written 250 years ago. Let me read it again. Many people, if permitted to speak on Judgment Day, would curse you for leading them to hell by your worldly lifestyle. Now, that may not be you. You may not live the worldly lifestyle. But I'm talking to you about finding people who can do what we know we have to do before eternity, and that's tell other people. Salvation is not a patched up old lifestyle. Salvation is a U-turn. Salvation is phenomenal. Salvation is real. Salvation doesn't turn us into Bible bashers or glory, glory, whoopsie, doopsie, whatever we are. Salvation gives us full, amazing, eternal life, but the journey between here and heaven is phenomenal. The richness of our race is so enhanced because we know Jesus. People go through hell in, on the earth in torment with things that they go through, and when they lay in bed at night, especially as they're approach, approaching their three score years and ten, don't tell me they're not thinking about eternal issues. Don't tell me that they're not thinking about what's going to happen to me. Where am I going to end up? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? It is death of the old, then new birth, and the result is new life when we know Jesus. We have the U-turn. We have repentance. We turn around. Our lives are of supreme value when we choose to live God's way. The best way to live your life is to lose it. So then pure, godly resurrection life comes through. There was a guy, he was a missionary in Africa. Um, he was killed and his wife wrote a story. I've forgotten his name. I think it was Elliot. But he said, he is no fool. I've got to remember it because I didn't write it down. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. We will all one day be in the presence of God and many who think they will be there won't. You have the words of life. God will make you what no man or place of learning or church can do 
God will make you everything if you go his way. His way, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Find someone and lead them to Jesus and teach them to do the same. Don't think you have the goods. Read God's word. If you feel like you can't do it, if you're too timid, if you're too, um, like, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, I remember years ago, I was going overseas and I was catching the plane. And the day before, I ran to the shops to buy some last minute articles. And I sat down on the seat outside Woolworths after I'd bought my articles. And I pulled out my list to look and see I had everything because I was going away. And a man came and sat beside me and I talked to him about the Lord Jesus and I led him, or didn't lead him to the Lord, but I came very close. I, I, I could see that he, he was ripe for the picking. And I left him with my phone number and I went about my business. The next day he rang me, terribly, terribly emotional on the phone. He said, what you said is true. I can't stop thinking about it. All night, he said, I want to give my life to Jesus. Well, I was jumping on a plane in about two hours and I couldn't go and visit him. He lived in Naranda. But I was going to a Bible study and it was led by a man in Naranda. And so I rang the man up and I said, could you pop around, please? Here's the address. Here's what I said. I haven't got time tonight, today. I would normally but I'm hopping on a plane in two hours. Would you pop around and just lead him to Jesus? Take him through a simple salvation prayer and then get him to come to church if you can. Oh, no, he said. Oh, no, that's not my calling. I couldn't believe it. He led the Bible study. I couldn't believe it. I rang... I rang a, a very dear friend and a person in the church. I rang Vic Ashworth, who many of you would know. And he said, Samir Shaw. And he went around and led him to Jesus. And that man came coming to church until eventually he fell. I mean, he died. He, that's how he fell off the perch, I was going to say, but I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He died. <laughs> was, <laughs> excuse me. Excuse <laughs> me. Okay. I want to talk to you about if it's too hard now because I've got to make it practical. It's no good giving you all this good news without giving you a way to make it real for you. So here's some ways that you can lead people to Jesus. And then when you've led them to Jesus, you can teach them to do the same. The best way to, to teach somebody something is by experience. Now, people say to me easily, it's okay for you, Samir, you've got a burden for the lost. I've got a burden for the lost because I asked Jesus for it. I asked him for it. I didn't want my friends to go to hell. William Booth, who started the um, Salvation Army, he asked God to dangle him over hell for five minutes and the, the end result was the birthing of the Salvation Army denomination. Not as we know it today with their shops and their goodwill and they're doing all that. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what he birthed. He birthed the Salvation Army churches that go out or used to go out at 9, 10 o'clock at night and find someone lost on a street or someone who didn't have a meal or someone like that and bring them to Jesus and then bring them along to the fellowship. And William Booth did that by asking God initially for five minutes dangle over hell. Can you imagine the torment of asking God to dangle you over hell? You'd go nuts. You'd go crazy but it'd have to do something in your soul, in your spirit. So if you don't think you've got the goods, you do have, because the Bible says that we are to go out after the lost. And then in 2 Timothy 2.2, it says, teach them to do the same. Imagine us. We're all, I would suppose, all Christians here. And if we had led someone to the Lord and taught them to do the same, what a trophy what a trophy. I was led to the Lord through Sunday school. I went to Sunday school. My Sunday school teachers saw that mum and dad had situations that were difficult. Dad was in hospital. A little brother was sick and dying in hospital. And they took around a box of food with a leg of lamb and left it on the front door. They didn't even come in because mum and dad weren't home. But another time they came and mum and dad were home. They knew who'd bought the box of things because they had another box in their hand. And they showed their love. We can all show love. We can all show love. You ask God to put someone on your, on your, in your mind who needs a bit of love and he'll do it. Okay. I want to tell you a few ways just quickly and then I'm going to finish. 
This is how you can gear yourself up to have the guts, to have the courage, to have whatever it takes to win souls for Jesus and teach them to do the same. Pray about it. Don't treat prayer lightly. Prayer is your communication with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus, who gave his life so that we would have free access. We don't have to offer sacrifices. We have free access, and that's a privilege. And we treat prayer lightly sometimes. But it's good to talk to him and to keep him in conversation. But every so often, seriously, seriously, get in in business with God about souls that are going to hell. Put prayer front and centre in your life. Pray for the unsaved. Weep for the lost. Get a passion for them. If you haven't got a passion, get it. You know, when someone that's dear to us dies, we weep. Well, do your mourning and your weeping before they die if you think they're hellbound, because that's going to be effective. Bible says good things about our tears when we weep, when we show emotion. And we can show emotion. When, God, when we get to a place where we don't even know what we're praying for, the Bible calls that intercession. And we can intercede. We can stand in the gap. There's a place in the Bible where he says, who will stand in the gap? And if people would stand in the gap, he wouldn't have to say it. But he said it. Who will stand in the gap? Will you stand in the gap? Will I stand in the gap? You can think you're really powering on with Jesus and you're doing enough. But there's another place where you can maybe reach out to someone. Okay, here's some ways you can win souls. There are programs in churches, particularly this one, because we all belong to it, where there is a program that you can latch someone into. Sunday school. You might know someone in your street who doesn't go to Sunday school and mum and dad would never take them and never go to church. If you befriended that family, you may be able to pick that kid up and bring them to Sunday school. Same with youth. If you befriended that family, maybe you have to take them, um, I don't know, you have to bake a cake. You know, when I first, when Neil and Joy first moved to Perth, to Perth Neil, Joy bought me an apple pie. I'll never forget that. Do you remember that, Joy? She bought me an apple pie. You read about those things. That's the first and only apple pie I ever got from someone else. (laughs) Don't bring me an apple pie, please. I don't need an apple pie. But Joy bought me an apple pie. You know, that ministered to me. I remember that 50 million years later. Well, a long time later. (laughs) Befriend folks. Build bridges. That's why we've got the Sunshine Program. I haven't got the Sunshine Program because I like dealing with folks. I've got the Sunshine Program so that other folks, like you can come along, if you're able, and sit with someone over a period of weeks, even if you're not interested in what they're doing, but show interest, and then eventually, because you've built a bridge of friendship, talk to them about eternal issues. Eventually, they will see the light that shines in you, and they may even say, what makes the difference? And you'll tell them. You won't say, it's because I shop at Woolies and I get all the bargains, or I go to the gym and I look lovely and slim, that what makes the difference. You'll say, it's Jesus in my life. He's made the difference, and he can make a difference in your life. Use tracts. You know the old-fashioned tracts? Go to Kurong and read some tracts and find out a few that are you, because some of them are ditty. They're really, you wouldn't use them. And I don't necessarily mean stand on the street corner and hand out tracts. You can do that if you want especially if God tells you to do it, well, go and do it. But have one or two in your bag so that you can hand them out in a situation. Sometimes you really want to talk to someone about Jesus and the bus comes so you haven't got time so you can quickly give them a tract. Tell your story. The Bible says our testimony is powerful. Tell your story. Please don't hide your story. Your story is powerful. The Bible says people are saved By the word of our testimony, it actually says that. Pray for guts. Pray for guts. Pray, God, give me the courage. Give me the tenacity. Give me the fortitude. Give me the umption in my gumption so that I'll go out and speak to people about the Lord. Remember that song? Give me umption in my gumption. Let me function. (laughs) Give me umption in my gumption, I pray. Give me unction in my gumption, make me function, function, function. Make me function till the break of day. I remember that one, Sunday school. Imagine people in hell. 
If you're serious about winning the lost, spend some time in prayer and imagine people in hell because that's the option. There's only two places. There's no purgatory. There's no praying them out of heaven, out of hell when we're in heaven. I don't understand what heaven is really going to be like. I know that I know that I don't have the mind to fully understand it now and that I will because the Bible says all things will be made plain on that day. But I sure as heck want to be there and drag as many people with me as possible. The founding axiom of Sunshine Program is to plunder hell to populate heaven. That's our founding axiom. And I have to remind my team every week almost that if we had a really wonderful running program, which we do have, it's amazing. People come, we get anything up to 60 people come and they love it. And there's a lovely friendship, a lovely family feeling. It's a wonderful program. And when we didn't have it over the COVID thing, people missed it. But I have to remind my team all the time, if we just do an excellent job, we might as well be the CWA or the Rotary Club, and we're not. We're about bigger things. We're not about entertainment. Nothing wrong with entertainment, but let's use it for a cause. We're about plundering hell to populate heaven, and you can have that founding axiom in your life. Plunder hell to populate heaven. It must be done on purpose. It's not going to just happen. You've got to make a decision. I was praying about this message and I thought, I'm not going to have an altar call because my praying for you, mature Christians, may not make any difference at all. You're going to have to make the choice. You're going to have to decide, I want to have that in my life, Lord Jesus. I, I may only have 20 years left in my life, five years left. We don't know. You can go out there and get hit by a bus. So could I. But let me make some good. Let me do some damage for Satan. Let's get out there and be active. You can, I still want to go through these. I've got quite a few. Let your light shine. Don't ever be timid about the gospel. They used to call us Bible bashers. Now we just blend in because there's so many different other flavors out there that it's quite trendy to have something in your life, something to do on the weekends, something to get involved in. It's quite, it's okay. You're not a Bible basher. You're just one of those people that's got something else in your life. So it's trendy. So we don't even have that um, separation anymore. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. I've had people say to me, but Samir, it's boring. And you know what? If I was honest with you, there are times I find the Bible I would hate to say boring, but I do find it not so challenging as other times. I'm, I'm being honest. But if you push through, it is God's word and it is his guidebook for life. And I find when I read the Bible and I don't necessarily get anything out of it that day, the next day, and a week goes past and I've just read the Bible, but I might be speaking to someone and suddenly there's a, an there's an impetus, there's an anointing that I didn't even necessarily feel because God works through you, because you're his person and you've done what he's asked you to do. He says to get into the word. He, he encourages us to get into the word. So get into the word, even when it seems boring. You will find the benefits you won't even know about half the time. Some of the benefits you probably won't find out until you get to eternity. Make an opportunity for people to see you. Make a friendship. Go out of your way. The Bible says that we need to be given to hospitality. And the reason is so that we get to know people and we can win them for Jesus. So if you're not one for having people round for dinner, people are busy today, two people working, all this kind of thing. Who's got time to have the neighbours around for dinner? But find a way. Find a way. Have a picnic and invite the neighbours to join you. Have a dinner party, or not a party, just a dinner. Say, pop over for tea. We're only having a, a bowl of soup tonight, but would you like to come? Take them. Take them some of your soup you've made and drop it off at the door. Find an opportunity to win a friend. Give something away. Sometimes something you can give away is costly. You might, you might say to the kid next door who's a bit of a you know, renegade for mum and dad, look, the youth are having a, a, um, a camp can I pay for your kid to go on camp? Or you may not say, can I pay for your kid on camp? You say, we've got a special way we can get him there because mum says, oh, I can't afford that. 
But be sacrificial. Be sacrificial in your giving so that others will see Jesus and come to know him. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you if you ask. Let me say that again. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you if you ask, and he will. If you dare to say to God, use me, he will. I've said it, and I meant it, and he did, and he does, and I love it. Utilise church programs. I said that already. Sunday school, youth group, ladies' meetings. Claire has concerts. She puts magnificent concerts on. You can use it as an opportunity. You can go out of your way. You know she'll probably have a concert at Christmas time if we're all allowed to be together. Start talking about these things so that people have an anticipation. When's that lady at church having one of those concerts you've been telling me about? So use things because they'll come under the sound of the gospel. It might only be subtle, but then the next time it's subtle again and it's all chipping away, chip, 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 and eventually some of those people will come to know Jesus. And if you have to, pay for people. Be generous. Don't be mingy. Don't be stingy. Be generous. Go out of your way. Buy a cheesecake for someone and let them know it's because I love you. After a while, they'll see the loveliness in you and they'll wonder why. Okay, so that's all I've got to say. This is the end. But in ending, this is what I want to say. I want to give you back the two scriptures. Okay. This is 2 Timothy 2.2. And the instructions which you have heard from me along the way with many witnesses transmit and entrust as a deposit to reliable and faithful men who will be competent and qualified to teach others also. It's our charge. It's not an option. It's our charge. Here's Ezekiel. Again, it's from the Amplified. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not give him warning or speak to warn the wicked to turn from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Iniquity is a fancy word for wrongdoing. It's about similar to sin. But his blood... I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered yourself. Thank you. Now let's just conclude with a word of prayer. And then if you um, have a particular need that you'd like us to pray for, then you're welcome to come to the front. And just uh, our tithes and offerings too, which uh, I was actually going to pray and thank God for them. We have a box in the back uh, just where Wayne is, over in the corner, so uh, you can pop your tithes and offerings there. All right, let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we, just, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement we thank you for the challenge that has contained. And I pray that you would give each one of us um, a bit of a revelation, a bit of an insight as to how we can sow the seeds of the gospel into the lives of others. Lord, so that no matter what our personality, no matter how sometimes we might, might feel that we don't have anything to offer, but, Lord, we do. We have a story, a testimony to talk about how you have moved in our lives. And no one can argue against that. So I pray you give us the courage and the opportunity to just share your word with those around us. So, Lord, we thank you for the time that we've shared together. We ask your blessing as we continue to, uh, to meet over a cup of tea, coffee, and um, we commit our week to you. In your precious name. Amen, Lord.